Welcome back to our online Bible study. Uh, we've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit over the last few weeks, and tonight we are going to look at two more elements, which is goodness and faithfulness. So right off, what does it mean to be good? Can we explain what it is? This element of the fruit of the Spirit at first reading can seem very simple. It's just being good. And what does it mean to be good? Is it just not being bad? Is that how you explain it? I'm not a bad person, someone says. I, I try and do good. Does that answer all the questions of what does it mean to be good? You can ask those questions until you are faced with some of the words that Jesus used. In Matthew 19 and verse 17, a man had come to Jesus and called him good teacher. Jesus stops him in his tracks and says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. And that will bring us right up with a start. Only God is good. So what chance do we have? Can we present our goodness? Well, actually, you can't present your goodness to God by way of you know explanation of whether or not he would accept you or not. Because that is, it. to God, what we have to offer is just like filthy rags. There has to be something renewed in us, something reborn, something, a new beginning, if you will. And of course, we know that as being salvation. So right from the start, I think we've lost the grip on what it is to be good in the light of Scripture, because our general understanding of it is so much lower than the Bible's reference to it. It is the very nature of God and requires for us to be good it requires a redemptive work and that redemptive work of course is our personal salvation through the person of Jesus Christ by which we are renewed and born again so goodness this element of the fruit of the spirit by very nature must and has to grow until Christ is formed in us we ought to see a continual development of this character within our life and manifestations of it will be actions and thoughts and deeds but it has to be attributed to God so does it mean kind deeds it will involve kind deeds but it does not mean kind deeds does it mean generally being helpful it will involve being helpful I'm sure but it will not be defined by that what we're looking at is the outward expression of the inward change this element of God, do they see Christ in what we do? You will recall these words because of the, the disciples came to Jesus one day and they said, show us the Father. And his response to that was, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. So Jesus could show the Father by being who he was. And now we have to be able to show Christ as we represent him and I wonder sometimes, do the world see Christ or do they just see the church? It's a big question, but it, it begs to be examined. Do they see Jesus or do they see us? So, you know, do we decrease that he may increase? Those questions are all born out of what is it to be good? So the spirit is at work in us and seeks to manifest uh, this goodness of God. And I need to stress that it's not an upgrade of our own goodness. It's not just getting a bit better. It's a complete new person thing. It's growing in the grace of God, this goodness of God, the very nature of God. I think to see this in a clearer light, we need to probably go back to the beginning, uh, beginning of creation, right back at the start of the Bible. Um, and repeatedly, when we go there, we will find an unfolding work of creation and God being recorded as proclaiming over everything, it is good. He made everything and said the first day, it is good. Second day, it is good. It is good. It is good. And when he'd completed everything, he said, it is very good. He uses that superlative, the overall blanket, if you will, of everything he made. It is very good. God's nature of goodness, literally meaning his moral sense, 
uh, that moral sense of God invested in creation. Now goodness was everywhere. Everything was made good. Everything was good. Everything had the goodness of God about it. And then enters in sin. It comes into the picture and it stains everything. And that stain of everything that was originally created perfectly now seeps through the whole of creation, touching every generation. Redemption is the only way out of that problem. And the goodness of God is having to be aligned with the righteousness of God. It would have been righteous for God to have just wiped us out. But the goodness of God had to deal with remaining righteous and doing the good, being good and righteous. The answer to that, only God could have come up with it. The answer to that is Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This sacrificial death and resurrection of Jesus opens the door for us to receive him. That same spirit that brooded over creation now broods over you. This wonderful goodness of God permeating through your being. Uh, it's, so it's not our, our goodness, our, our broken goodness being pumped up. But it's, it's not just becoming more moral. It's actually being renewed. It is being changed from one degree of glory to another until Christ is formed in us. So you see the goodness that we're talking about here is far more uh, than just our, our human nature doing a nice thing, uh, being helpful, as I mentioned, but the very nature of God um, being manifest in us in renewal. I think it's important and might be helpful to go to Micah, um, Micah chapter 6 and verses 6 through to 8. Let me read these words for you and you can go back and look them up and ponder them uh, when you've got a moment so it's Micah 6 verses 6 through 8 with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God shall I come before him with burnt offerings with calves a year old will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams ten thousand rivers of oil Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. You see that first part, that human, that human part. What shall I do? What would be good for me to, to appease God? Shall, shall I make sacrifices? Shall I give everything I have? Uh, what shall I do? And the prophetic word back is, you know what God has said you should do. You should do justly. You should love mercy and walk humbly with God. You see, our human approach to goodness is tainted by our own self-importance of being human beings. And left to our own judgments, we'll excuse our wrongs and we'll disguise our intentions. I think that comes to light in, a pas in this passage, which is in Isaiah chapter 5, uh, it's verses 20 and 21. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. So we uh, excuse our wrongs and disguise our intentions. In the light of that, we could look at this um, part of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 and 24, when Paul writes these words. He says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. So goodness is not just our human endeavour to do better, but a Holy Spirit infusion of Christ Jesus' very nature 
being developed in us. I think I've driven that home enough to uh, see that as being so fundamentally important. We have been in the Old Testament, we have looked in the New Testament, and there are the two words, one in the Hebrew and one in the Greek. Um, in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, uh, there is a, uh, a reference to goodness probably more akin to our modern understanding of it, which is some, it means something pleasant and comfortable. While in the New Testament revelation, it digs into the deepness of that and into the goodness of God, and it comes across as meaning the ins inspired you know, and powerful uh, nature of God. So, uh, of course, the gospel, the gospel literally means good news. And the good news comes from a good God who, by his spirit, seeks to develop the nature of Christ and that goodness in us. So the picture here, just to recap for a moment, that it's not an upgrade of our human goodness. We have a residue of the goodness of God in us. Uh, I'm not really one to go with the total depravity of man. There are flashes of our creative uh, being. Um, what God has made us, we're different from the animal kingdom. We have flashes of that. But we are a fallen race. We are a broken people. And without Christ, we are lost. And so we need the goodness of God. We need salvation. We need redemption. We need forgiveness of sins. We need to be new creatures in Christ Jesus. We need to be born again. We put that into the package. And then, of course, now it, the goodness, the goodness of God can only be manifest by Christ being formed in us. So now you have that particular picture. I hope goodness seems to be a little bit more than just um, doing good things. Now we're going to go to faithfulness. People who read the King James Version will come across it mentioning not faithfulness, but faith. And actually, the original word uh, is faith. It is simply the word pistis, and it conveys moral conviction. Um, it's, a, it's very gentle, it's, but it's powerful. It's a powerful element of the fruit of the Spirit because it becomes the very bedrock of our commitment to Christ. Uh, we speak of coming to faith. We speak of being of the faith. So you see that it's it's written into who we are as believers. Um, if I ask someone to pick a, a scripture that references faith, my guess is that most of us would come up with Hebrews 11. So we'll go there. We'll have a look at that. It's the first two verses. We'll try and unpack some of this. So it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. We can stop there a moment. Uh, that's a great passage. Um, and it says there's a grand list here of Old Testament saints and patriarchs who stood the test of time and st stood the test of faith and held on to the hope. They didn't see that come to pass, but they were faithful in it. So the, here they are, faithful, faithfully holding on to the promises of God. And uh, they obtained a good testimony because they held the faith. It begins <clears throat> with unpacking that. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. It then lists the list of patriarchs of old who exercised faith. I'm not going to read the whole passage. Um, you can do that yourself, and I, I encourage you to do that. Um, go back and get your Bible open and uh, look at the whole package. Read through uh, Hebrews 11, that opening part. But these are some of the people. There, there are more, but there are on the list. Here are people who held the faith. Uh, Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob. Joseph, Moses, and a whole line and list of others. And uh, the writer to the Hebrews then says, it's verse 39 uh, <clears throat> through to 12, 2. 
actually. It says, and I'll read it because it's important for us to grasp this in the picture of our dealing with faith or faithfulness. All these, that's the list of the list of the patriarchs of the past, all these having obtained a good testimony through faith did not receive the promise, God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I wonder, just in passing, if you ever take a moment to think about the long line of people who were known as the uh, fathers of faith, if you will, who ran before us and trusted God. Yet they did so without ever seeing the promise. Now Christ has come and, and we are the ones so privileged to run the race with revelation. The revelation of the word having become flesh and dwelling amongst us full of grace and truth. The one who died for us and rose from the dead and sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. We are the privileged ones. So when you think of faith or faithfulness, can you see yourself as one uh, who, of many of course, who is standing firm in the faith? Do you stand firm in the faith? I mean, we've got a lot of witnesses in the Old Testament who stood and never saw the, the, the revealing of it. Now Christ has come and now we are privileged to stand by faith in him. <clears throat> we've got to see this ever-growing element of this fruitfulness of faith in our lives. Uh, <clears throat> granted, of course, and nurtured by the Holy Spirit. Going back to Hebrews 11, we're going to repeat that. I just want to pick back up on that. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I think that word substance is key and most important. Uh, the word is a compound word. It's two words put together to strengthen the meaning. The two words, when they're put together, uh, have a very, very strong statement attached to them. Uh, the word, the words are the combination of hupo and stasis, hupostasis. Uh, and those two words put together literally means to place underneath, to confidently support. Let me say that again. The two words, hupo and stasis, come together to strengthen the meaning. And those two together mean to place underneath and to confidently support. Now think about it in these terms. Let me take that and put it into the text. Now faith is the construction of support that upholds things we hope for. It supports our hope. It is the evidence, the proof of things we expect. If you can see it like that, I think the whole thing can open up. Because this faith causes us to see that the faith that we have in Christ is not some new fancy idea, but the culmination of the long-held promise held by the saints of old, now manifest in Christ Jesus and affirmed in every believer. So when the world talks about Christianity being 2,000 years old, Christianity is the natural opening revelation development of that which was right from the very beginning. So as we read through this list in Hebrews 11, you constantly find these words repeated again and again and again, by faith, by faith, by faith, one after the other. It also goes on in chapter 12, 1 and 2. I'm going to expand on that for a moment. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, that means the old saints that we mentioned, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run 
with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God's throne. Now I'm repeating that for the purpose. The Old Testament saints can inspire us, but they're not our central focus. Our central focus is looking unto Jesus, author and finisher of our faith. Now I know some refer to this text as those who have gone before us, um, gone into heaven, cheering us on. I don't think it means that. In fact, I'm sure it doesn't mean that. What it means is we've got this history, this evidence of generations of faithful people, patriarchs of old, inspiring us as we look at their life, and look at their testimony, and look at the trials they got through, and look at how they uh, held fast to God, and even in times when they failed, they, they, they come around and trust in the living God, not seeing any outcome. They inspire us to say, we have seen uh, the revelation in Christ Jesus, and now that drives us on. Why would we not move forward? It says he's the author and finisher of our faith. It begins with him, and it ends with him. Uh, you don't have to muster faith. You don't have to work it up. It grows. It's got to grow. Feed it. Feed it. Open yourself up to the word of God. Read great things about the faith of God in scripture, the faith of people. But come to Jesus, author and finisher of our faith. It will blossom in everyday circumstances. It'll do what is good for you. And it'll do you good. So goodness and faith or faithfulness are right now being developed in you. They are the reflection of Jesus in you. And so coming to the end of that tonight, uh, I want to really encourage you to believe that there is something happening in you, in all of these elements of the fruit of the Spirit, that is nurturing the very nature of Jesus in you. So you think of goodness, uh, not just a few kind Words and deeds, but the manifestation of the nature of God. You look at faith or faithfulness and you see all the strength that goes from trusting in the living God and the resurrected Christ. And I trust that you will hold fast to that in the name of Jesus. And God bless you. We'll be picking up another couple of elements next week. So I hope to see you with us again. God bless you.